This is our third session now on Ephesians 3, 1 to 6. And what I want to focus on here is the implications of this word as. <laughs> so we better see it in context because that doesn't mean anything to anybody until we read a little bit. Let's see, where should we pick it up? Let's just read the whole thing. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, break off the sentence, if you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, namely that, according to Revelation, the mystery was made known to me. So there's the issue. How clearly had it been made known before it was made known to Paul? The mystery was made known to me, as I have written before briefly, by which In reading, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations. Not at all? Or does as here mean it was made known, but not as what? Clearly, fully, precisely, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So, Father, I pray that you would grant us not to misstate or misunderstand the degree to which you had made known the inclusion of the Gentiles in the Old Testament as fellow heirs and members of the same body and partakers of the promise through the coming Messiah, through the gospel. If it's there, Lord, show us that it's there that we might get a sense of how you had been planning and promising for a long time. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, let's look at a few passages. You remember, I I explained last time that the word mystery as Paul uses it, it doesn't mean something so obscure or complex that humans can't grasp it. It's something, rather, that's been hidden for some time and now has been revealed. And my question is, how, how hidden was it? Does not made known to the sons of men in other generations mean it wasn't at all made known? Or does the word as here means it wasn't made known, but not in the same way it has been revealed. So, for example, let's go to um, Genesis 12, 2 and 3, the most fundamental place as far as Paul is concerned. God says to Abraham, or Abram, I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. That starts to open up a little bit, maybe beyond Jews. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now that seems to point to the fact that somehow, through Abraham and his seed, the sons of Abraham, the children of Abraham, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. And here's what Paul does with that in Galatians chapter 3. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, that's what we just looked at, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and thus presumably give them an equal footing with Jews, preached the, gen- the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, and here's that quote, in you shall all the nations be blessed. Genesis twelve three. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham. So Paul is drawing out the implication that 
the blessing that Abraham enjoyed, the Gentiles now enjoy by being people who believe in the Messiah and thus have the faith of Abraham and thus have the same standing with Abraham. Here's a pointer to the full inclusion of the Gentiles in Isaiah 49, 6. The Lord says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. So that promise that God's salvation would spill over the banks of the tribes of Jacob and reach the nations and to the ends of the earth is a pointer that God's mercy towards Israel is going to be extended to the nations. And here it is in Isaiah 56, 6 and 7. The foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, everyone who keeps my Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant. So all these foreigners who hold fast God's covenant with Israel, these I will bring to my holy mountain, and I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. So my conclusion, just from these three texts, and there are so many more of varying degrees of clarity. My conclusion is that when it says here that the mystery of Christ, the mystery that was made known to Paul, which is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise in the Messiah, in Christ, that that fullness of participation in salvation, being full fellow heirs of the Jewish remnant saved by grace, was made known beforehand, but not with the same, let's just say, clarity, fullness, maybe precision, So it was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed with such amazing clarity as in verse 6 and in verses 11 through 22 of chapter 2. And so this as here is significant in affirming that there was a sense in which these things had been made plain to Israel but not as plain and not as full and not as precise as they have been now revealed. So God has been planning and prophesying toward this mystery the whole time, though he did not reveal it in fullness until Christ came.